Hey guys, Tyler Ansman here with Tyler Ansman Performance. So today we're going to talk about the relationship of connective tissue, elasticity, and throwing velocity. All right, so for a long time in kind of the sport performance uh, field in general, there's been a large focus on kind of muscle driven movement um, and kind of like muscle related output. And that's an important part of the equation, but connective tissue hasn't been getting its due for a long time. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about how that relates to kind of throwing velocity and overall athletic output. Okay, so all athletic movements use a proximal to distal sequence. Um, for the most part. And so basically what that means is kind of the, the more proximal segments are going to be your bigger kind of force producing segments. They're going to do it relatively slower, but they're going to produce kind of higher amounts of force. And then if the movement is sequenced properly, those kind of more distal portions of the body are going to be, they have higher velocity capabilities, but lower force producing capabilities. They're basically going to be in charge of kind of transferring and amplifying that energy. And so we can see this when we look at kind of sprinters, right, in terms of the hip versus the ankle. So the muscles around the hip and, and all that around the hip are in charge of kind of producing these large forces, but again, they don't do it very quickly. And then the ankle complex is in charge of kind of ultimately kind of transferring that to the ground and they do it at very high velocity, but they're not producing nearly as much force as kind of the, the musculature um, and tissue around the hip. Um, and then we could see the same thing in throwing, right? So the pec and the lat are kind of your big force producers, and then kind of the more distal portions of the arm are gonna transfer and amplify that energy, all right? And so this is this kind of highlights our point of timing and connective tissue being extremely important. And so kind of what that means is this kind of highlights the importance of staying relaxed as long as possible when you're throwing a baseball. If those muscles are firing out of order, we're not gonna ultimately kind of take maximal advantage of that kind of kinetic chain or that proximal to distal sequence, all right? And so for a long time, this has been viewed as like kind of a, a muscle driven issue, but it's not just that we know that now that connective tissue plays a pretty huge role when it comes to this proximal to distal sequence. Okay, so let's define connective tissue. So basically it's meant to kind of maintain uh, the structure and integrity of different kind of portions of the body, all right, kind of broadly speaking. And so in this category, we find tendons, ligaments, and fascia. And tendons and ligaments can kind of be further categorized kind of under this fascia umbrella, if we want to think about kind of everything um, in that realm as being fascia, all right, which we're going to for the purposes of this. And so <clears throat> kind of for a long time, they, it was kind of just viewed as like a structural tissue, but now we kind of understand that it's really important for kind of transferring and amplifying energy as well as proprioception, all right? So there's kind of a lot of proprioceptors in fascia. Um, and so it really is important in that realm as well. And so what we kind of see when we're talking about connective tissue is like, why is this so important for throwing velocity is this reflexive return that we get when we kind of properly utilize this connective tissue in terms of um, kind of getting this, this stretch and then return or this kind of storage and then um, utilization of elastic energy is what we get from this reflexive return is greater in both velocity and force than we could get from volitional movement. So if we can utilize connective tissue correctly, we're talking about a, a much greater potential for throwing velocity than we have um, if we're looking at it just purely as a muscle driven movement. Okay, so let's define fascia a little bit more specifically. So Robert Schlepp, one of the world's experts in fascia, not positive that I'm pronouncing his name exactly correctly, so I apologize for that, defines it as um, kind of a body-wide tensional force transmission system made of these fibrous collagenous tissues, okay? So basically fascia is primarily made of collagen, um, and what it basically does is it kind of wraps everything in the body like plastic wrap. So it goes around organs, it connects bone to bone, connects muscle to bone, all of these things. And it kind of has this body wide kind of tensional force transmission uh, kind of property to it where everything kind of goes through this. All right. And so kind of within this fascia has three main properties, right? Viscosity, plasticity, and elasticity. All right. So what do we mean by viscosity? Well, fascia is primarily made up of collagen and water. So hydration is a pretty important factor when it comes to this. So well hydrated fascia should glide over itself, right? And fascia that is not well hydrated, right, is gonna kind of get a little bit stickier and gunkier and that kind of stuff. And this has important implications for kind of movement and movement restrictions, um, which obviously can impact throwing velocity and all of that. All right, so plasticity. So this just means that fascia is extremely adaptable. 
Um, so Davis's law basically states that um, connective tissue will remodel based on kind of the inputs that it's given. All right, so this is really encouraging because it means that even our less kind of elastically inclined athletes can get better at this if we give them the correct inputs to force this tissue to kind of adapt um, the way we want it to. All right, so elasticity. So fascia can store and release a lot of elastic energy. And so kind of as we discussed before, this is really important because these kind of elastic and reflexive recoils, they happen faster and more powerfully than volitional movement does. So we really wanna make sure we take advantage of uh, this property of fascia. Uh, just a couple other important factors related to fascia are proprioception, which we kind of mentioned briefly earlier, and forced transmission. And so on the proprioception side, basically what this means is there are 10 times the sensory receptors in your fascia than in muscle, right? So we know this from research. Um, and then kind of on this side, if we don't train fascia properly, proprioception kind of basically means like understanding where your body is in space. So if we're not training it properly, then you, there's gonna be some implications for how good your movement is and adjustability and kind of all these other factors that are really important to kind of throwing a baseball um, effectively. Um, and then, so on the force transmission side, basically what this means is that this connected tissue is kind of helping transmit force throughout the body. This is kind of the whole concept behind um, Thomas Meyer's anatomy trains. Okay, so let's talk about the performance factors. All right, so we kind of know, based on everything we've talked about today, that it's not just kind of maximal force production capabilities that kind of um, make your ability to throw a baseball really hard, right? It's other factors as well. So it's not just that, it's how quickly can we produce this force. It's how well can we transfer and amplify this energy, right? It's kind of all of these pieces together. When we're asking somebody to throw a baseball really hard, we're asking them to move through these really extreme ranges of motion and transfer this energy efficiently so we get this really kind of high output at the end of this. All right, and so for that to happen, we need kind of these contractions to happen, these accelerations, these decelerations, these, these relaxations, all of this kind of together is really what we're talking about when we talk about kind of the role of connective tissue. And so if we don't have this well hydrated tissue that we've kind of trained specifically for these demands that can store, release a, uh, store and release a ton of elastic energy, we're really not gonna maximize kind of our output of, of, uh, of our bodies, right? And so kind of the main factors that we're gonna discuss Timing, range of motion, stiffness, and reflexes, and kind of how these relate to the connective tissue. So in order to kind of take advantage of the stretch shortening cycle, athletes kind of must be able to kind of store and utilize this elastic energy. And so kind of where that's coming from is um, kind of this deformation of our elastic tissue. So muscles, fascia, those kinds of things. And then when it returns to its original length, right, that's kind of where that's then utilized. All right, but this energy can't be stored indefinitely, right? So in the human body, we're kind of talking about somewhere between 120 and 150 milliseconds um, when we're talking about kind of the, the half-life of a cross bridge. Um, and so what this means is if this isn't timed effectively, we're not gonna kind of maximize the output of this. A lot of that energy is gonna be dissipated as heat. So timing is a critically important thing, kind of like we talked about here with the proximal to distal sequencing. If we're getting things out of order or if things are taking too long, we're not gonna maximize the output here. All right, so range of motion is, you know, at least in some cases, kind of pretty obvious when it comes to the pitching delivery because we're asking guys to go through some pretty extreme ranges of motion um, when it comes to this, and that's, you know, for a few reasons. But one of the things to kind of really consider here is length tension relationships, right? So every muscle has kind of an optimum kind of length tension relationship that exists, right? So either um, kind of too short or too long, and we're not gonna maximize the number of cross bridges, so therefore kind of force that it can create, all right? So what we kind of know about this is that we wanna be in an optimum range for muscles, but what's kind of important to remember is that the longer we can get to, the more we're gonna be able to kind of stretch those passive elements, right? So the elastic elements, the, the fascia, the connective tissue, all that kind of stuff that we're talking about today. The, the deeper range of motion we get to, the more this is gonna get stretched, the more elastic return we're gonna to get to it. So we may be incentivized to kind of change that length tension relationship to be kind of towards a deeper range of motion. All right, and so we also know from research that if we, if, if muscles are kind of biased towards a shorter um, range of motion for that length tension relationship, they may be more likely to kind of uh, be vulnerable to injury. All right, and so we can kind of think about this in terms of what's optimal <clears throat> for a pitcher. If they have um, kind of, if they're going through this extreme range of motion through kind of horizontal abduction and retraction, and their pec is kind of biased towards it, it, it's you know it's optimized towards a shorter 
length tension relationship, then we're not going to be able to produce a ton of force from those deep end ranges of motion. So we may be getting something from the elastic tissues, but we're not going to be getting a lot of muscle force from that. So that's not great. All right. The other side of this is that if we only go through that optimized range of motion for a guy who's kind of optimized towards a shorter length tension relationship, then we're not going to get, we're not going to maximize that elastic return. So there are some things we can do on the training side to kind of change this length tension relationship. And that's why this range of motion is kind of an important piece to consider when it comes to kind of maximizing your utilization of connective tissue. So kind of our next important factor to consider is stiffness. All right, so we have kind of two sides of a coin here with connective tissue. We have stiffness and compliance. All right, so, you know, compliance, a more compliant kind of connective tissue will require less force applied to it to get the same deformation. A more stiff tissue, right, will require more force to get that same deformation. All right, and so these kind of have different implications. So we need both right? More compliance is going to be required when we're producing force and more stiffness is going to be required when we're kind of transferring force or energy. All right. And so we can kind of see this if we're thinking about kind of being into that back leg and producing force when we're pitching, there's going to be more compliance, right? Bigger range of motion. We're taking more time to kind of do these things. Um, we're producing force. When we think about the lead leg block and kind of transferring that energy up into the torso, that's going to require more stiffness. It's happening really quickly, not a big range of motion, right? And really, really fast. Okay, so when we're talking about how do we do these two things, right? So if we think about like kind of fast movements, they tend to result in more stiffness. And the reason is when that happens, this, the collagen molecules tend to move as a sheet. All right, so if we think about kind of like belly flopping into a pool, right? That's your fast movement. The water's kind of acting like collagen would, acting as a sheet, really stiff when you hit it. All right, and then on the compliance side, and we kind of move slower, these. Um, some of these other movements, then what happens is the collagen molecules are sliding past each other and they're breaking these cross links. So it results in less stiffness. So if you think about entering a pool really slowly, right, more compliant. Um, and so that's kind of the difference between the two. So we need both, all right, but stiffness is a pretty important thing when we go to talk about rate of force development. So we think about kind of this stiffness and how it relates to the rate of force development, right? We can think of kind of RFD equals the signal from the brain to the muscle, right? Then we have the stiffness of the connective tissue, and then we have the movement of the bone, right? So if we have that stiffer connective tissue, that signal from the brain to the muscle is going to act on that movement of the bone faster because we're going to pull on it more kind of abruptly. So this is kind of how that impacts the, the rate of force development when we're talking about throwing. Obviously, it's a pretty important factor. Okay, so kind of the final factor is reflexes. So we talk about plyometric movements, of which throwing is one. Um, we're really talking about movements that rely on kind of the myotatic or stretch reflex to kind of get this reflexive output that we've been talking about. And so what that means is this kind of goes hand in hand with the proprioception stuff because we're talking about sensory receptors within the muscle tendon unit. So we have two basic ones we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today. So we have uh, the Golgi tendon organs or GTOs and then we have the muscle spindles. And so when we think about muscle spindles, right? They're sensing, they're sensing um, kind of the velocity and the magnitude of a stretch. And so when they say, hey, this stretch is too great, what happens is they send a signal to contract a muscle to produce force to stop that stretch from getting any further. So if we think about kind of like dropping off of a box, like for um, like a depth jump, right? We're getting that, that sensory um, kind of output of that myotatic or stretch reflex. And what's happening is that muscle's turning on really quickly and it's enhancing the output of that concentric action, okay? So we can kind of apply this to throwing relatively simply. So we have Golgi tendon organs on kind of the other side of this, right? So they're, t they're sensing tension or force, right? And they basically just kind of shut that action down if it, if it kind of gets to be what it deems as unsafe, okay? So both of these kind of sensory receptors are often kind of set too low, like the threshold is too low. So, you know, a governor on a motor kind of keeps the driver from driving at an unsafe speed, but it makes these maximal speeds um, unapproachable, right? And so obviously when we're talking about maximum performance, we want to kind of unlock those top end speeds a little bit more, all right? And so kind of how we do this is what we're going to cover in part two, along with kind of how we're training every aspect of this in the practical application side of that. So stay tuned for that. Um, thanks for watching. If you got something out of this, please subscribe. Feel free to comment below. If you got questions about training or want to reach out about remote or in-person training, shoot us an email. Thanks.